I'm Pastor Bill Pitt. I'm a retired Methodist pastor, and uh, I was in the Navy 30 years. Uh, I've been an attorney 31 years. I got tired of that constant turnover every 30 years, so I became a pastor. I don't have to retire now. Okay. So I became a pastor in 2004, and have been pastoring ever since then, which has been a really a big blessing to me. When people said they thought that I should be a pastor, I started reading the Bible for particular verses that might uh, apply to that. And um, I learned that the word Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is believer's information before leaving earth. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I read it with that in mind. God's guidelines. And I do believe that the Bible is true. There are verses that I don't necessarily understand what they mean. But that's just because I don't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means I need more understanding and more wisdom. So that's the way I look at it. One of the things uh, I've heard from many pastors is God's in control. Amen. I don't believe that. Now let me tell you why I don't believe it. Because God always wants to do good for us. Yes. The devil always wants to do bad for us. So who makes the difference? Who controls whether it's good or bad? We do, with our free will, whether we decide to turn towards God or decide to turn toward evil, whether we know it or not. So from that standpoint, we are in control. You made the decision to come here tonight to get closer to God. Others didn't. Mm -hmm. So we are in control. And uh, when I started reading the Bible, I looked at John 20, 21. It's not a verse you'll hear in any churches that I've been to anyway. And then Jesus said, as God sent me, I am sending you. Now, as an attorney, I looked at that as a power of attorney. Anybody here ever dealt in real estate? Yeah, we use powers of attorney here in Texas with real estate. So Jesus was giving us all of his authority and power. And um, that's really good because that means each of you that are believers have that same access to his authority and power. When you look at uh, John 14, 12 and 13, Jesus said, pray in my name and I shall do it and give glory to God. So I learned right away that Jesus wanted to give glory to God and that his name was unusually powerful. Yes, very powerful. When you look at uh, Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, it says believers will. Now, how many here are believers? Anybody here a believer? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Believers will cast out demons. Believers will put their hands on the, the uh, sick, and they will get better. They will get well. So right away, I learned that our call on earth, what Jesus wants us to do, is to use his authority and pray for ourselves and pray for other people so that we can overcome the work of the devil. And actually, the Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 8, that the reason Jesus came, the reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, we've all heard, well, Jesus came to love and save us, but we don't hear many times about the other thing that Jesus came to do. That's why when Jesus prayed for healing, he was destroying the devil's work. When he prayed for deliverance, he was destroying the devil's work. So, when he said in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, believers will cast out demons, that's what he was talking about. He had given that authority to us. So, <clears throat> the churches I had been going to didn't have any healing. They would have prayer, but they didn't actually have anybody get healed in the process. I didn't like that because when I read the Bible, Everybody Jesus prayed for got healed. So I thought there must be something that we're missing that Jesus did. <coughs> Pardon me. So I started studying what the Bible said about what Jesus did. And I found that he always spoke to the issue. He never used a Bible verse or anyone for healing and miracles. Many times you go to the altar, that's all you hear, Bible verses. Well, that may be one reason why Jesus prayed and people were healed as opposed to not being healed. So I developed, <coughs> pardon me, 
Is there a little water around here? Yeah, if you want some water. If you got water, put it. Soda. So uh, what I've done is I've tried to, to devise prayers that always speak to the issue water. in the name of Jesus, giving glory to God, and doing using all the other powers that Jesus gave us. We know that signs and wonders, which is another word for healing and miracles, uh, in Mark 16, 20, God says they were given to confirm his word. So signs and wonders are not one part and his word another part, but signs and wonders show his word, reflect his word, perform his word. So the two go together. That's really important to know. We know that in James 5.14, Jesus, uh, the, the Bible tells us to go to the elders of the church, receive prayer, and if you sin, you will be forgiven. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So it's good you're coming to church. I'm an elder. You have an elder here who's invited me in. So there are always people to pray for you. Now, the elder isn't necessarily limited to a pastor because it says if you're a believer, you shall do this. So anybody who is a believer is an effective elder for this, this purpose. So congratulations. You all have more power and authority than maybe you ever thought you had. <laughs> That's good to know. And uh, when I look at the long term, where are we supposed to be going? Ephesians 4.13 says that the job of the church is to bring us all to maturity, to the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Think about your life. What would it be right now if you had the fullness of Christ in you, working? What would it have been as you grew up if you had the fullness of Christ? So, every day is the day to take the next step towards the fullness of Christ. So I recommend, I don't care where you're at or where you've been, Tomorrow, take that next step and go more towards the fullness of Christ. And how do you do that? Well, one thing is you pray. Another thing is you give up your right to control to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Because God says he likes an obedient person, not somebody who's rebellious. So we have to put those things aside. We know that Jesus also um, saved people in his prayers. There's a word in the Bible called sozo. Anybody heard that word before? S-O-Z-O, sozo. And it means saved, healed, and delivered. And the leper, you remember he prayed for the 10 lepers? Yeah. One leper went and came back and gave him thanks and worship. That one leper, the Bible says, was sozo. So Jesus not only healed him with a miracle, but also saved him. So those are the three things that Jesus did wherever he went. Of course, we know he raised people from the dead. Uh, that's good too, right? That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things happen like that in Jesus. And uh, I try to do that. Jesus said in John, what was it, John 14, I think, uh, 15, 13, said that, Great, that we would do greater things, and uh, that's what I've been trying to do. I formed a ministry called Judah Lion Ministries. <clears throat> and Judah Lion Ministry is a ministry we go around the world, to different countries, and places here in the U.S., and we pray for people's healing. And we have seen wonderful things happen. I mean, I've seen people, a person with a stroke, come in like this, and go out like this. I've seen people that had... Uh, Lock jaw, you know, they couldn't open their mouth literally, start to go like this. Uh, we had uh, two people in Brazil that were born blind, both men, and before we left, they started seeing light and dark. Uh, we've had ears recreated. We've had really wonderful, amazing miracles. But here in the U.S., we still have miracles. They just don't seem to be as frequent. I think that's because we tend to be taught against God in many areas, our schools and our politics, and uh, to the extent it has been true, the Supreme Court knocking, <coughs> knocking that uh, down. But times are changing. So 
So I'm really happy that the times are changing. We know that when there's a problem, there's a reason. And I talked earlier about the thief, that devil. In John 10:10, 10, 10, it tells us that the thief comes only, only to steal, kill, and destroy. So anytime you have something wrong, you know the thief was involved in it. And uh, there was one time I, I had a, a godly lady, and after talking with her, I noticed that she really did not have anything good to say about God. So I asked her, what do you have against God? And she said, well, God took my husband from me. Well, I asked her the circumstances. And what I found out was that her husband was a smoker. He was advised by the doctors to stop. He was coughing a lot. She asked him to stop. He would not stop. Guess what happened? He died with lung cancer. And uh, I looked at her and I said, well, do you think God made him not want to stop? Well, she said, I never thought about it. I said, well, think about it. Do you think God wanted him to suffer? Do you think God wanted you to suffer? And she says, well, I don't know. I said, show me a verse that says God will make you suffer. <laughs> she couldn't find one. There is none. So what I showed her was in John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So after talking about it, what she finally decided was that the thief came and destroyed her husband, took him, killed him, but Jesus received him because he was a believer. And then she could change her mind, repent. You know, repent really means change direction, like this. And she could love God, which was really wonderful to see that change in her. So just think about that. If, if anything has happened in your life, you've lost some loved ones, you've, you've had friends that have turned against you, you've had maybe family members that aren't really helpful, if you know what I mean. Well, it's the devil working in them. Now, each one of us, we know what God thinks about us. Psalm 139, verse 14 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and his works are marvelous. Have you all heard that verse before? Amen. Amen. Well, that's the truth. So anything we think about ourselves that is other than awesome and wonderful and marvelous is a lie. We know that John 8, 44 says the lies come from the father of lies, and that's Satan. So Satan fights us, tries to separate us from God through the lies about ourself and the lies about others. Now the lies have a double impact because the lies also generate emotions. So if you think you're bad, you have negative feelings about yourself. If you think somebody else is bad, then you have negative feelings about them. If somebody has hurt you, you will be offended. Well, that offense is a negative feeling toward whoever offended you. You may have shame, blame, or guilt because the thing, something you did, you don't believe you should have. Well, we all make mistakes, I'm sure, that we've all done something. You know, I, I have two. I'm not holier than thou, for sure. So, when we learn to forgive ourselves, and to forgive others for their mistakes and offenses and give it up, then we feel so much better. I've really found that when somebody has done something against me and I, I truly forgive them, and the Bible says and bless and pray for them, right? Yeah. When I truly do that, it lifts me up. It makes me feel better. And it doesn't matter what they're feeling like. I remember as an attorney one time, I, in court, an attorney did a really bad thing. He talked to the judge behind my back. Well, you know, the judge is supposed to be fair and impartial, hear both sides. Well, this judge didn't. And so I held that against him. He was under my thumb for 20 years. I would go to court and I would look to see if that attorney's case was on the line. And if it was going to come up, I'd try to figure out some way to give him the shaft in a way that he'd know that I did it. I was looking for vengeance. Uh -huh. I was looking for vengeance, and that's not good. Yeah. When I became a Christian, I found out that I had wasted my time. He wasn't hurt by my anger, by my offense. I was, because yeah. it tied me up emotionally, and it tied, up, tied me up thinking about that rather than trying to think about the goodness of God. Yeah. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I've learned so many hard lessons that I'm sharing with you all so that you can hopefully not have those similar kinds of lessons. We know that Jesus is life abundant. You know, John 10.10 10 is really an interesting verse because it has what I think is a, the combination of the Bible. Uh, the first part says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, which is the devil's power. The second part says Jesus came to give life abundant, which is God's part. So the Bible is about the thief and God, and that verse says it all. So when Jesus comes to give life abundant, well, it comes to the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, love and joy and peace. That's what we have the right to. What I've found is that we have to be in the right position to receive what God has for us. If we try not to follow his guidelines for whatever reason, it tends to cut off what he can do for us. It really does. It's like if when you were growing up and you went to your mother and father and asked for an allowance and they asked you to do some chores around the house and you said, no, I'm not going to. Do you think that would make them wanting to give you more of an allowance? Not really. And it's like that with God. The Bible says that he rewards us. And I've heard some people say, well, you can't, you can't do that for a reward. Well, the Bible says we are supposed to. God does it that way. He says, if you have treasury in heaven, we're to save up our treasury in heaven. Well, if, that's, if that isn't for a reward, I don't know what it would be for, right? So just keep that in mind. We are supposed to get rewards, and we get rewards as we follow his guidelines and do what he wants. You know, the Lord's Prayer, Mark 6, uh, Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10, say, your will be done. Uh, yes. It doesn't say Bill's will. Yes. It doesn't say my will. It says, your will be done. So that is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to be doing God's will. And our challenge is when we make a decision is to first make certain it's what God wants for us in that circumstance. Uh, sometimes we, we make the decision and then I found that, oh, I didn't ask God first. So I'll say, Lord, is that okay? <laughs> Sometimes he'll say yes, and sometimes he'll say no. <laughs> so then I have to confess to repent. And 1 John 1, 9, in the letter at the back of the Bible, is a really important verse because it says that as we confess and ask for forgiveness, we will be restored to all righteousness. So what that means is it doesn't matter what we have done, where we have done it, or to whom we have done it, if we truly repent and confess and ask for forgiveness, he will restore us so that we'll be just like we were with no sin, all righteousness. That's a wonderful gift. That is a wonderful gift. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that God has plans for us. He has plans to harm us and put us down, make us sick. No, no. He has plans to prosper us now, prosperousness is more than just financial gain. Prosperousness is for every area of our life. Here in this facility, some other places, with your family, wherever it is, his plans, what he wants to do is to prosper us. But he needs our help to do that. He needs our help by being open to what he wants, asking his decisions, and following his guidelines. We know that he not only plans to prosper us, not to harm us, that's an important part, not to harm us, but to give us hope and a future. So, I don't know about y'all, but uh, I'm over 39 now, and uh, I still need hope and a future. And as long as you're drawing a breath, I pray that you all still need hope and a future. Well, God is ready to give it to us. And uh, that's what's so good about the Christian faith, is that we have such a good God. We don't have a God that's ready to put us under the thumb. We don't have a God that requires us to be perfect. You know, there's no verse that says that we should be perfect in what we do. As a matter of fact, sometimes when we grow up, that's a problem growing up because we're told, uh, do better, get better grades, do your chores better, mind better. So we learn that we are human doers. 
human doers. We have to do something to get approval. But that's not God's word. God's word says he looks at our heart and he doesn't mind what we do if we do it wrong as long as our heart is in the right place and we're trying to do what he wants. And that's good because I've tried a lot of times but not necessarily got it done, you know what I mean? So uh, that's true for all of us. He wants to look at our heart. And as long as our heart is the heart for God, he is happy. I know some people doubt the Bible. And uh, there are reasons that they rationalize and think about why the Bible may, be not, may not be true. But the truth is, that it's the most reliable ancient work in all the world. When you look at all of the different uh, famous books, famous stories, famous writings, they'll have from one maybe to six writings. Well, there are thousands of books in the Bible, uh, copies around, New Testament and Old Testament. When you look at what the Bible itself says about itself, well, you can look at 2 Timothy 3.16, and it says, the Bible is true. All scripture given, is given by the inspiration of God for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So we know that the Bible is not because of one man's thinking or a group of people thinking, but from God through the Holy Spirit. I found that what the thief does, and one of the big reasons why I think uh, God wanted to destroy the works of the devil through Jesus, is that what the thief does will hinder, delay, or block what God wants for us. So if you have a force or a spirit of pain, it stops you from enjoying yourself. It stops you as much from having a better relationship with those around you because you're thinking about your own problem, right? That's what sickness does. It separates us from others. And it also could be depressing. I don't know about you, but if I have a pain I can't get rid of for a long time, I get a little depressed. Anybody resemble that remark? Yeah. So sickness and pain, conditions, arthritis, and all that stuff, those are all from the devil because he doesn't like us. And uh, if you're over 40, you have arthritic conditions in your joints because that's just wear and tear. So when I was, actually I think I was 43, I went to a doctor, I had a sore knee, a nice young lady, and uh, I said, doctor, this knee hurts. And she looked at me, she looked at my chart, and she saw I was 43, and she said, oh, you have decrepitis. <laughs> decrepitis. I said, are you mean I'm getting old? And she says, yes. I said, well, you know, this knee is just as old and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, really. And so I asked her to send me to the orthopedic doctor who understood the joints. She didn't like that, but the truth was, she didn't have the understanding to know how to diagnose what was wrong with my knee. She just went from there. <laughs> oh, you have big crepitis. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm sure in my medical files, there are several negative comments about myself. Because uh, I, when the doctor says X, I try to establish it as true or not. And if they can't establish it as true or not, I don't receive it. That's like they try to tell me that I had cancer one time. I went in with a stomach ache. I'd eaten the taco at a new place. I thought I probably got a bad taco. And so I went in with a stomach ache. They kept me overnight. And MRIs, x-rays, you name it, they did it. And when I got out the next day, they said, well, we think you have cancer. And I said, well, how do you know that? They said, well, we'll have to do exploratory surgery. I said, well, I came in for a pain in my stomach and nobody has addressed that. They said, oh, well, take two time and all. <laughs> so I went through that all night long so I could take two time and all. Well, when it came time to do the exploratory surgery, they couldn't find anything. It wasn't cancer. They were guessing. You know, they call it a practice because they're not perfect either. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's why they'll give you pills and say, well, try this. They don't know what's going to happen. 
They know what they hope is going to happen, but they're human, and they haven't had spiritual training, so they don't know what to look for. So I love doctors and nurses because of all the skill and, and, and uh, effort that they put into it, but that's just a part of the problem. You know, I've prayed with a lot of people that after I prayed with them, the symptoms have all disappeared. And I find more people that doctors have said, oh, there was a misdiagnosis, yeah. uh, oh, it was bad equipment, oh, or it was bad interpretation of the test results. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say it's a miracle, but I know that there have been miracles. I prayed with one person that had a, a, a hip replacement. <laughs> Does anybody here have a hip replacement? Okay, well, what I was told, and you can confirm if this is true, what I was told is that with a hip replacement, you cannot move your leg side to side because it wasn't built that way. Is that? I can move my thighs up there. Can you move as much as I am? Yes. And I'm 87. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so at the, time, at the time I was praying in it with this person, they couldn't do that. After prayer, they could. So. Uh, yeah, of course. Of course. You pray as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, things happen. Things happen. We know that wherever we are, we don't have to be lonely. Now you may say, well, I've got no family to visit me, and the neighbors aren't so friendly. But you know what? You have Jesus inside you. Amen. Amen. And we can always pray to Jesus. So what I would like to do tonight is to pray with you. Yeah. And I've learned that the cells have memories of all the hurts and all the things that have ever hurt us. If we believe there's some truth in it. Amen. If there's no truth in it, it doesn't hurt us. So uh, what I would like you to do is to emulate what I'm doing. I found that if we involve ourselves in prayer, then we have a greater cleansing. So what I've uh, devised, if we shake our hands up and down as hard as we can without hurting ourselves, and breathe out deeply with our mouth open, at the same time, we can put all of our stuff on our hands. First Peter 5, 7, Jesus says uh, that he cares for us and we're to give him all our cares. So say, Jesus. Jesus. This is a prayer you repeat. Jesus. Jesus. I put it in my hands. If you don't want to get healed, don't do it. But if you want to heal it, you've got to say the prayer. I put in my hands. I put in my hands. All my pain. All my pain. All the lies I've ever believed. All the lies I've ever believed. All the unholy soul ties I've developed. Unholy soul ties I've developed. Well, soul ties somebody influencing you negatively. Yes. All of the generational issues that were opened in my life. All the generational issues that were opened in my life. And all the evil forces that have come to make all these things worse. All the evil forces that have come to make all these things So, Lord, when I start shaking my arms and hands, and breathing out deeply, breathing out deeply, with my mouth open, with my mouth open, I'm giving it all to you. I'm giving it all to you. So look out, Lord. Look out, Lord. Here it comes. Here you go. Now start shaking. I'm just keeping it until you feel the release. <laughs> oh, God has given me joy because He's so glad that you're releasing stuff. That the devil is done. We're destroying that devil's work. Amen. <laughs> and at, when you feel that release, stop. That way I'll know you're through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, how many people feel better? Oh, come on. That's not <laughs> We all have broken hearts from all the injuries that we've received as a child all the way through adults. So say, Lord, Lord you came to heal the broken heart. 
Redeemed. He is broken heart. So why now and put all my broken heart parts right now. Right now. Broken heart parts. in my hands? In my hands. I'm going to raise them to you with all the mind parts and soul parts and ask you to put them back together so that I may love you with my whole heart. So just lift them up to him and then put your hands back on your chest and just wait for something to happen. And let me know. And we may... We're okay. Okay. I just didn't want to make the recording go too long. So did something happen? Mm -hmm. What happened with you? Right. Yes. What happened with you? Yes. Me? Peace. 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 So relax, peace. That's normally what I find people have happen mm -hmm. when they give the parts to Jesus to put back together. Now you can say, Lord, Lord I make a decision, make a decision. <laughs> to love you more love you with my whole heart and to love my neighbor as myself. Amen. Well, God bless you all. And I'll be happy to pray for anybody afterwards uh, that wants individual prayer. Okay?